Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the BioExcel webinar. The webinar today, that is number 54, is uh, applying the accelerated weight histogram method to alchemical transformation. Our presenters are Per Kess from the Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden, and Magnus Lundborg from Erco Pharma, also Sweden. I'm hosting the webinar, I'm Alessandra, and together with me, there is Arno Prohm from the University of Edinburgh. Before, I just want to point your attention that before, in the BioExcel webinar series, we had already a webinar telling details about accelerated weight histogram. We will post in the chat the link, so if you are interested to have a look to the general method, you can have a look to that webinar. The today presenter are, as I was saying, Berkes. Berkes, Professor of Theoretical Biophysics at the Royal Institute of Technology. He designed a lot of algorithms that are implemented in the Gromax simulation package, and his current research focuses on advanced sampling method, aggregation of molecules, studying wetting of surface at the molecular scale. Magnus Lundberg, he got a master's degree in pharmacy at the University of Uppsala. Then he got his PhD in organic chemistry at Stockholm University. And after he moved for a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. Since 2012, he works in the Biomolecular Biophysics Group in Stockholm. And since 2050, he is employed by Erco Pharma. He's, working, he's calculating permeability through the intercellular lipid matrix in a stratum cornelium in skin using molecular dynamic simulation. And now I give the word to Berg. Welcome all today for this um, webinar where uh, I and Magnus will present an application of the accelerated weight histogram method to alchemical transformations. Um, so I'll present the first half of this webinar and Magnus the second half, and then you can ask questions too either or both of us afterwards. Um, so a short outline. So I'll have a very short introduction to alchemical free energy calculations. I would think most participants are somewhat familiar with this if they are interested in this webinar. Then I'll describe the basics of the AWH method, which I said was already presented in another webinar, so I won't get into much detail. Then Magnus will present examples of applications and also uh, show how to set up such calculations in practice. Okay, so let's so let's start. Um, first, what are, are alchemical free energy calculations? So, um, well, first, what are free energies? Let's explain that. So, free energy difference um, is basically nothing more than the relative population between states but expressed as an, as an energy. So if one has two states, the state A and a B, then um, the free energy difference between us, I see now that I, I forgot to change some indices on this slide, there's a two and a one, which should be an A and a B, or a B and an A. Um, so the free energy difference between these two states, uh, you can uh, re-express as a ratio of, of probabilities by taking the, um, the exponent of this free energy difference divided by the, the thermal energy unit. So, Free energies are basically nothing more than differences, they express differences in populations, which of course is a very important property to know how much a system is in a certain state versus another state um, that might be of interest. <clears throat> and then there's techniques to compute such free energy differences as we'll discuss today. Um, some examples here, so there's one example here on the bottom left of solvation free energy, which is rather important, especially in parameterization. Of, of force fields, but also um, for actually um, investigating properties of, of molecules and how they behave in solvents or if they so if they are soluble. Which um, here is is drawn as a well, you could think of it as a physical process where I would take a solid molecule and I would uh, have a solvent separately, and then I want to know what's the free energy difference of uh, solvating the solute in solvent, or what's the probability of the solid being in solvent, uh, which is equivalent to the free energy question um, using the above formula here. Uh, this could, you could actually do 
through a, a physical path by take, taking a solid and moving it into solvent, which in practice is usually not the best way to compute it. Um, but one often uses what's called an alchemical um, path or non-physical path where one transforms interactions between molecules. Like in this case, one would have a solute not interacting with the solvent and then you can slowly turn on the interactions to make it interact with the solvent and make it feel solvated. So that's alchemical in the sense that we change interactions of the molecules. So this is not physical, but we change the, the, the properties of the, of the atoms and the molecules in the system. Um, on the right here is a, is, a, is a more complicated example, but that's quite common in, 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 in uh, biomedical applications in the pharmaceutical industries. For instance, if you want to develop uh, a new drug molecule or an inhibitor, which is why it's called, probably called I, which inhibits an enzyme, a protein E, then you might be interested in um, if I change some atoms on my inhibitor, on my ligand or drug molecule, from I going from I to I prime, as is shown here, what's the binding? How's the binding affected of this molecule? Does it bind weaker or stronger? So you might, for instance, be interested in making a drug that binds stronger to your target molecule. Then uh, here, what you're interested in is, is is always in actual physical quantities like this delta G1 and delta G2, which tell you how strong does the inhibitor bind to the molecule, to the protein, but that's difficult to compute. So you can actually compute through thermodynamic cycles, which tells that since the free energy is a state function, any circle you make going through state should, the free energy should add up to, to zero. So this means that I can compute what in this case is called the delta delta G, a difference of different free energy. So the difference in binding free energy, um, I can compute delta G3 and delta G4 uh, instead, which is much easier, and compute with that the difference in binding free energies between these two ligands. And this is again called alchemical because I'm changing here um, the ligand molecule from one molecule to another. I may be changing the character of some atoms, adding a few atoms, removing a few, um, and thereby changing atoms or molecules. So that's uh, what we call alchemical. <clears throat> so this is a, a very powerful technique that's used in many different applications, as probably many of you are aware of. So there are techniques available to do to compute such such free energy differences um, more or less efficiently, and they, they've been available for quite some time. And their improvements have been going on, which will uh, explain one improvement that we've made here today. So how do you how do you do this? So formally, how one does this is one is what's called a coupling parameter approach. So to do this, you add a an, an coupling parameter lambda to the Hamiltonian. In this case, it's written now generally as a full Hamiltonian, but in many cases, as I in this, like in the slide before, it's often just to the potential energy that you have to add the coupling parameter. And this is done such that in a state uh, at lambda zero, the Hamiltonian corresponds to state to the Hamiltonian of state A, and in lambda, in the case of lambda is one it corresponds to the Hamiltonian of state B. So now I've formally made a path from state A to state B. And then you can ob obtain the free energy by free energy difference by integrating the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to, to lambda. I haven't derived this, this is a rather simple uh, derivation. So this actually, you can see this as the work that you need to do to change the system from A to B. Uh, so this, this is one way of, of writing the free energy difference. There's actually other ways in discrete, which like with the Bennett acceptance ratio, which I will, don't have time to go into in this um, presentation. I'll refer to that. But this is the basic mechanism. So you, you extend the Hamiltonian with a coupling parameter. And then here it's not written how you actually do this. So here it's only written that um, lambda zero should match the state to the Hamiltonian of state A and lambda is one should match then the Hamiltonian should match that of state B, so the endpoints. How you couple these endpoints is up to up to you. So you can do whatever you like, but some choices are more efficient, other choices are less efficient. So in this presentation, I also want to discuss options for, for making paths here. Um, in Gromax are some options. There's continuous research going on to, into improving the path here to make it, things easier to sample and more efficient. Okay, um, so uh, why do you actually need such a path uh, or why do you need intermediate lambda states that uh, values? That's because often 
there's no overlap between the states. Like in the in the example of uh, solvating a molecule in water, for instance, unless your molecule is so small that it's methane, there are no holes in water that are large enough to fit a molecule. So that means that my phase space, I've shown here a schematic representation of phase space in two dimensions. So you could, for instance, say that the red, the red part here is my my molecule not solvated in in in, in water, and on, on the blue part it is solvated in water at lambda is one. Um, then there's no going to be no overlap in states because the molecule is so large that there are never cavities, so you could not fit in the molecule in water as is. So you need to create space in water. So you need to create some kind of path here. Um, between these states. So one thing one can do here, friend, if you just have these two states, the coupled and the decoupled molecule, you can compute this, this derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda, if you have machinery in the code to do that, which Gromax has, for instance. But then this DHE lambda might vary a lot in between, so you just get it at the end state. So that's not good enough. So you need to do something more. Um, and what you need to do is create this lambda path in between here to create overlap. So that's something that you need to do for any method estimating free energies, you need to have enough what we call phase space overlap to be able to compute free energy differences. So here we've drawn some, some more lambda values, some more colors in between, and now we have all these circular uh, phase space, or sorry, all these sampling regions that overlap in phase space now, and now we can do something. So now one can choose different methods to compute free energies. So to, to make this connection, you actually need to choose an efficient path which um, in Gromax there's a limited set of options to, to do that. There's some parameters you can vary. And you need to choose points along the path. So here in this case I've chosen we have the two end states and I added four points in between these end states. So I have six, six points in total. Uh, so that's another choice you need to make. <clears throat> okay, so let's see what, what, what we can do now. So now we can compute free energy differences from this. So one way is what's called thermodynamic integration. That was the old way that we used when I started my PhD, um, where you compute this derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda, as I showed before, at the different points that you have independently, and then you integrate that. But that actually leads to integration errors or quadrature errors, because you only estimate the derivative at certain points and not in between. So this gives you a systematic error that you can only get lower by having more lambda points. So what's the, 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 the standard method now also in Gromax is to use what's called Bennett acceptance ratio, which explained very shortly on the right here. Uh, there's more to it to, to this. I should have put in a reference, but this is uh, too complicated to explain here in this talk and off topic. So, but what you do here is you use differences in energy between the lambda values. So you simulate at lambda zero, the red ensemble here, the red state, and then you compute and Hamiltonian differences from lambda is zero to the next state, which is in this case 0.2. And you do the same thing for lambda is 0.2, you compute Hamiltonian differences to lambda is zero. And for these two energy differences, you can do a, a very accurate, in certain sense, unbiased free energy estimate, uh, free energy difference estimate between these states, which is what Bennett acceptance ratio does. Okay, so let's see what we do now. So what, what we now uh, do with, uh, with the accelerated wave histogram method is we've, we, instead of doing simulations at fixed points for each of these lambda values, we now let lambda move. So we now added lambda as a dynamic variable using Monte Carlo. And here's a small animation of, of, of how that uh, could go here. So we, we start out for instance lambda zero, and then um, the, 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 the system samples and moves uh, not only in phase space, but also along lambda. And then at the bottom, you see with colors indicated which lambda is currently active. So which from which lambda the forces go. And then to compute the free energy differences, we do the same that BAR does. So we compute these, um, let's go back here. We compute these energy differences that BAR does to all the other points at how how often we think is, is needed. So we get we get the free energy differences uh, between these lambda points here uh, all the time and we get a lot of information and we can uh, combine that information physically or mathematically correct to get an accurate free energy estimate. So this is a bit like, like actually M-bar or multi-bar where you have, where you use all the information to all the different uh, lambda points together. Okay, so how how does this work? So this is described in detail in several papers. So this method, the AWH method, was originally developed by Jacques Lidmar uh, for different applications. Then it was adapted by Vivica Lindau uh, for 
sampling collective coordinates in MD uh, in Gromax. So there's a webinar on this, which the link is, should be in your chat. Um, we also devised a metric for this, which is uh, something uh, maybe um, Magnus will show something on, uh, which tells you how you should sample along this lambda coordinate, which I haven't discussed here. So you, the lambda coordinate, you, there's, uh, you could, some regions might be easier and others might be more difficult. So you might want to take that into account, which the metric will tell you. And then the manuscript is, uh, has been submitted on this uh, new application, uh, which is, we hope will be accepted soon. Okay, so how does how does the AWH method now actually work? So uh, a short a short explanation on that is that this is examples from from uh, taken from the presentation on the or for reaction coordinates, but you could in the reaction coordinate can be lambda, like in this case. So the trick is that we add uh, we have a well we have a free energy landscape which is given by the lambda dependence that the system has, uh, and we want to sample in this case all lambda values equally. So to do that, we need to have a bias potential that should match the free energy. So that's this blue bias potential to flatten out the potential to make it, to make the effective potential flat, which is of course a problem because what we want to compute is the free energy. So we don't know that. So we need to have an iterative procedure to compute the bias potential, thereby also computing the free energy. Um, so that's what we, what we do. So we have a bias simulation. We guess some initial bias, which is usually flat. Then you estimate the, the distribution that you would have if you assume that everything is correct, which it's, it's not because you have the wrong initial bias. And then you can update it with the differences that you have observed from the samples to what you expect and then iterate this around. So that's what the method does. And um, here's another schematic drawing of how it actually does this and how it, how it adapts the um, the sampling and the free energy updates here. So there are some weights that are being updated. That's why the weight histogram method, it computes weights of different states. And then there's a number of samples involved. Uh, so slowly the method converges as the number of samples increases and the, the updates go down and you get more certainty in your results. Uh, so the updates, the free energy updates go down as roughly one over the number of samples. Um, so that was, that's what happens. And then we have an initial phase to make the initial phase go exponentially fast, which makes it really efficient. Uh, again, details are in, the, are in the paper or in the um, AWH webinar. Okay, so let's show an example here of um, how this goes. This for the double well potential. So you see that the system started out with a so it's pretty fast with a flat blue bias, and then slowly, as it samples, it converges this blue bias to the black curve. So you see that the free energy estimate improves and improves, and as it's you gain more and more information, it becomes more and more accurate. And you can uh, you can imagine that this this converges to I can run it again. So initial updates are very are very large, and then the update gets smaller and smaller as time progresses. So there's an initial exponential phase which is given by these factors two, four, eight, and then in there's a final phase in which the updates go down as one over the number of samples, and you converge to the to the final result. So this is holds both for the reaction coordinate AWH and for this new free energy application which is, uses completely the same uh, algorithms and machinery. Um, then one, uh, and that's, so an advantage here, let me go back, is that you now, unlike for, for, for other uh, simulation techniques where you have to do many different simulations uh, uh, given by the number of lambda points you take, because you have to run one simulation at every lambda point. So here we, here we run, um, sorry, so see the animation again. Here we run one simulation that samples all lambda points, so you can get your free energy out of a single simulation. But um, so that's nice. So you can only run, only need to run one, not manage a set of simulations. But you can actually parallelize that again if you want to have it run um, in parallel efficiently. Can I go to the next slide? Yes. We can use what's called multiple walkers. So I can run multiple simulations that all contribute to the same blue bias here. So here's an example. Uh, is that the movie? Yes. So here. Here you see, I think it's four, but it's difficult to see. This animation goes fast. Um, so now you converge much faster because you have many uh, nearly independent simulations contributing to the same to the same bias, so to, to the same free energy. Um, so they are coupled through the free energy bias. So this is convenient because you can have any number of walkers you want um, until it gets so many that your production time gets shorter than your than your equilibration time, then you're losing efficiency. 
Uh, and you can thereby reduce time to solution in a very flexible way. And the simulations are also easy to manage with MDRUN dash multi. So this uh, gives you a very convenient parallelization of the method as well, which Magnus will show results for soon. Um, so, oh, sorry. So there are a few choices to make for these free energy calculations. There's not so many actually, which is another advantage. So there's um, the number of workers that you need to choose for the parallelization, as I just showed. So you can choose this relatively freely according to your resources. Uh, it's only if you get very many, as I said, that you start losing efficiency. Oh, sorry. There's the, the number of lambda points you need to choose, but this is also an advantage here. They're not, not very sensitive. So you can choose sufficiently, sufficiently many. So there's not, not a, a penalty when for it's going from, from 20 lambda values to 100 or so. There's no, almost no overhead in cost. So you can choose a lot, whereas in, in other methods, you have to choose very carefully to get good efficiency. You should not choose too few and you should not choose too many. So here you can choose simply sufficiently many. Uh, then there's one main parameter, which is the initial update size, which is set by two parameters, a bit strange maybe, a diffusion coefficient and initial error. Um, so that sets how fast, tells you how fast the lambda moves and what the initial error is in your guess, which is usually flat. But I give you some numbers which usually tend to work. So something like 0.01 per picosecond and 10 kilojoules per mole. If you plug in that, then it usually works fine. This is not very sensitive either. So this is really nice because there's, so you can easily parallelize it with freely choosing uh, the number of simulations and the other parameters are, are not critical at all. So this is what one main main advantage of the method is that it's very easy to, to set up and to use. Um, okay, so now Magnus will take over and show some examples of our method. Yes, so I will continue here and present some examples that we have used for testing this method. Uh, so first, I will just look at uh, two compounds where we are calculating the solvation-free energy and just looking at the effect of the number of walkers in the simulations. So that with more walkers, you run short, shorter simulations, but you can run them then more easily in parallel if you have sufficient resources. And I am just showing two compounds here for comparison. And we can see that the number of walkers do not affect the time for the simulations to converge we see that they stabilize fairly quickly and uh, then are reasonably planar. And especially if you look at the scale of the uh, free energy units here, you see that it's quite small differences even between the sort of 400 total simulation time, 400 nanoseconds, compared to the full simulation time for ethanol. Likewise, we see that for testosterone as well, we see that more walkers do not affect uh, the efficiency, so you can more or less freely choose according to what computer resources you have. In both these cases, when I have been running one walker, I decided to run them uh, run five times as many simulations rather than run them five times as long, which is sort of the same reasoning that it's easier to parallelize uh, if you Likewise, here I only show the example for uh, testosterone, where I have changed the number of lambda points, so the number of intermediate states, from 16 up to 141 lambda points. And we also here see that there is not any large difference in the simulation results between quite large differences in the number of lambda points. So as long as you choose lambda points that you have sufficient overlap, this is a, a AWH method should work fairly well. And if you are uncertain, it's usually wiser to pick a little bit more lambda points. The simulations take a little bit longer that you have to calculate the free energy difference to all neighboring states, but it's, it doesn't make that much of an impact. 
And then finally, the sort of last uh, input parameter that you can change, which is the diffusion coefficient. We can also here see that the results do not change much for testosterone at uh, a range of a factor of 100 in, different, in uh, diffusion coefficient, where we are going from slow diffusion coefficient in black to a much faster diffusion coefficient in green. What we can see though is that the variation or the standard deviation goes down when you diffuse a little bit faster. So in general it's good to pick as fast diffusion coefficient as you can but if you pick it too fast you will create or get too high energy barriers in your PMFs. So you have to be a little bit careful but if you check that the PMFs make sense you can usually use a quite high diffusion coefficient. And here I can actually also mention the AWH friction metric that Berk mentioned. I will not go into any detail about that but there is a metric in the uh, AWH uh, method that shows you the friction at each uh, lambda point for the free energy calculations or the friction along the lambda reaction or uh, AWH reaction coordinate for if you are pulling for example. And this friction shows or tells you how efficient the sampling is at that point. And it's not implemented in Gromax yet but we are looking into doing that because using this friction you can change the target distribution so that you tell AWH to sample more where the sampling is inefficient. And that has been shown by Jack to speed up the convergence at least significantly, even if it might not be a huge difference. If we then compare the convergence using AWH to uh, equilibrium simulations using MBAR, we can see we can start with the ethanol case where we see that the we have a significant difference between the MBAR results and the AWH results. But when we added an extended ensemble simulation, the what is called the Wang Landau here, analyzed by MBAR afterwards, we can see that the AWH seems to agree with that and is placed right in the middle of the two other methods. So we are not too worried that the MBAR results here differ a little bit, but it's still, if you look at the free energy values, it's a very, a very small difference anyhow. And extending these simulations here might make the difference a little bit smaller. As we can see, if we jump over to the testosterone case instead, where we show two different AWH setups. So the black one here is just chosen because it's the one that differs most from the MBAR simulations and also has very low uh, standard error of the mean. Possibly since it's only from five simulations it might be artificially low. But we see that there is a difference here but it's not very large at all and when we use a little bit higher diffusion coefficient and only four work walkers, so what is shown in red, there is no significant difference to the uh, MBAR simulations that we can see here. But if we extend also the MBAR simulations here so that we see what happens at a longer time scale, we also see that it seems to uh, converge to at least towards the AWH results. But we also see here that the time scales required are quite long. So the blue simulation here is 70 nanoseconds in 27 lambda points, repeated five times. And in these cases, 
I have used an equilibri equilibration time that I have discarded the first five nanoseconds of the uh, equilibrium simulations. So what is the green and blue lines here? That can be uh, automated a little bit so that you don't have to choose it if you use the MBAR analysis tools. But I also wanted to see what happens if we extend the uh, equilibration time longer. So if we instead discard a whole 35 nanoseconds of the 70 nanosecond simulations. And then we can see that the results are quite close to what you get from AWH. Which also shows you that sometimes you might have to discard a lot more data than you would preferably like to in the equilibrium simulations. So even here discarding 35 nanoseconds is longer than most people even run equilibrium simulations. And now I will go to another fairly different example where I show how this AWH uh, with Alcambo Graphy and coupling can be used in a more advanced setting. So in this case, I will go through calculating permeability through the skin lipid barrier. And this is a quite complex lipid system. And the one problem is that it's in the near gel state, so it's almost frozen. You don't have much motion in the system, which also means that you have slow diffusion through the system and slow convergence. And that's a challenge when it comes to sampling. Here is just the same, but turned around because when I show the PMFs, it will be easier to, if you visualize the system in this way instead. And in the PMFs that I show, the center of this molecular system will be at zero coordinate and then it will be symmetrized so that I only show it in the positive coordinate range up to five nanometers approximately. So that will be in this interface. You will also notice that unlike most uh, lipid bilayers we don't have a large water layer in this system. We have a little bit of water in the head group region here, but the ceramides that constitute the system are extended here and then the system is just repeated. And first, when we studied this system, we used non-equilibrium pulling methods to pull the molecule through the system and calculate the PMF from that. And that seemed quite promising, but when we studied it further and reduced the pulling speeds, we saw that the PMFs were drastically affected by the pulling speed. That the slower you pulled, the lower PMFs you got. You can, of course, here also see that what I show here, we have quite large difference in the total simulation time here as well, but even if we extend the fast pulls to 10 nanoseconds, we don't see a large difference in the PMFs. So it's even if you can see that in the green and the blue case, there is a difference when we extend the simulation time by a factor of three, it will still be a fairly small difference also for the fast pulling case. But here we also realize that pulling through the system at this slow pace means that it takes a, lo a very long time to get the results that we want. So we cannot, so we cannot parallelize through the, or around that problem. And we also noticed, even if I won't show any data here, but that umbrella sampling also required very long simulations. And you often had to discard lots of data as equilibrium when you insert the molecules or if you pull the molecules through to generate starting configurations. So we realized that umbrella sampling was not very good for us either. We tried before I look into the we look into this picture, we start we tried also with the AWH just pulling through the system. But one problem was that since 
system has a very low diffusion, it can take a long time to visit all the significant regions. So when we then had developed this uh, AWH with the uh, alchemical uh, reaction coordinates, we combined that with pooling so that we have a two-dimensional free energy landscape where we have the pooling across the system in the Z coordinate here and the lambda state on the other axis where lambda state 20 here is the fully decoupled state where you see that we have a flat level here and lambda state zero is fully interacting with the system. So that you can combine AWH in this way which makes it very powerful. And what we then see is that we get a, diff a PMF that is more similar to the closest pooling PMFs, but still a lot more detailed. One note here though is that the uh, error estimations for the AWH is not correct in this case. It is only a, a very rough estimate and not from repeated simulations. We will come a little bit more uh, into that later. So we can see here that we can get a lot more data from combining these uh, two reaction coordinates. One thing though is that it's still fairly slow because using the free energy kernels are still not very efficient. So that's still a problem, but we are now we have decided that it's worth it, even if the simulations are not very quick. And as I mentioned, one problem with AWH is that there is no error estimation from the analysis. So if you are used to running a bar or MBAR analysis, you will get an error estimate from the results or when in the results. Whereas with AWH, to get the reasonable error estimate, you would will have to repeat simulations. And I would recommend at least four or five times to get a good estimate. However, you should also note that that's actually the best way to do it for equilibrium simulations as well, because the error estimates from BAR and MBAR are often somewhat underestimated, especially if you don't. Uh, sample all uh, configurations properly in all uh, at all lambda, st uh, lambda states. So I would still recommend that even for other methods that you repeat your simulations and calculate your error estimates from that. So now I will just quickly go through a little bit how you can run this in uh, Gromax. So there are two sections that you will have to look into and that's the free energy section and there you have the lambda states like normal and you what as we pointed out before you don't have to optimize the lambda point distribution very carefully when you run awh you just have to choose enough points that you have a sufficient overlap between neighboring states and then what you have to do is like if you run MBAR that you specify that you calculate the lambda uh, Hamiltonian differences to all neighbors, not only the next neighbors. And then in the AWH section of these simulation parameters, you need to set or use a convolved uh, Oh, sorry, here it should be the other way around. The AWH potential should be umbrella, not convolved. So that's something that should be changed. So because the convolved works with full dimensions, but when you have at, at least one alchemical dimension, you need an umbrella potential. But that's checked by the Go MPP as you generate your TPRs. Then you need to set your, uh, this. Uh, how many steps between your AWH samples to be a multiple of a, the number of steps you calculate energy so that you have calculated the 
any difference to the lambda states or neighboring lambda states when you sample the AWH uh, reaction coordinate. When you say that you, you are using the free energy perturbation lambda as coordinate provider for this dimension, you specify as start and end points the indices of the first and last lambda points, and then you set the diffusion as high as possible. If you're running multiple walkers, you all should, so should consider using equilibrate histogram where you, during the initial exponential phase that Beck mentioned, you will make sure that you first sample the AWH histograms so that they are close to the um, target distribution so that you have a sort of a flat sampling before you start the more careful linear phase. So this is just an extraction then or extract from MDP file to see the relevant sections. I won't go through this but if you want to go back and look at this recorded session you can have a look at this, these slides. And here I have written the correct AWH potential. So to wrap this up, now sin or from GROMAX 2021, AWH can be used for alchemical free energy calculations. There are a few input parameters, but it's not very difficult to pick reasonable values for them and it's not very sensitive to them. We have seen that it converges at least as quickly as equilibrium simulations. And within settings or with a multiple walk, uh, walker system, it's easy to use your uh, compute resources to parallelize the simulations. And then as I showed last, it can also be combined with AWH react, other AWH reaction coordinates, for example, if you're pulling through the system at the same time. And now we have time for questions. Okay, Magnus, thank you very much. Yeah. As well, for an interesting presentation. I'm sure people will find this useful. We've had uh, one question already saying, oh, where can I find out the MDP parameters? So I think I will put in the chat um, a link to the part of the, uh, the Chromex manual where there is um, the AWH options are, are mentioned there. We also have, um, on the BioXL website, we have a forum um, where people can ask about this. Now, if people are looking for tutorials or, or more information about how to do this practically, uh, Beric or Magnus, do you want to point them in anywhere else in particular? There are no good tutorials available, but with the uh, manuscript that we are have submitted on this, uh, there will be a uh, Zenodo link to a GitHub repository with at least the examples from that manuscript. Okay, thank you very much. So then with that, I will go to the question. Sorry, Beric, go ahead. No, it might actually be a good idea to, to have an example MVP file somewhere, huh? because this is uh, it's really simple otherwise. So that's basically all, all you need. So um, yeah, we should think about about that. We don't have it ready now, but it's uh, useful to put somewhere. We'll uh, we'll try to do that. Okay, we can put a link on the page on the website that has the webinar description, so that people can find it from there easily when they go back. So let's go to the questions. Uh, the first question is about similarity with Van Lando. So William Smith. Yes, uh, I'm familiar with uh, Monte Carlo simulations uh, as, as well as MD. This this looks like the MD an MD implementation of the Wang Lando flat histogram method in Monte Carlo that's been around for quite some time. Is that the case? Gromax has a Wang Lando scheme for this already. Um, mm -hmm. So that has that's implemented such that there's an initial Wang Lando phase, but if I'm not mistaken, that has incorrect convergence properties. So it's or incorrect it converges too fast, so you don't get you don't converge to exactly the right answer. Um, now that might not matter in practice in many cases because it's good enough. So as long as it, if you don't assume that your distribution is flat, that you correct for what you get, then then that might work. But that's, in Gromax, it's implemented as an initial Wang-Landau phase and then and then sampling with this bias that you accumulated there. 
um, whereas this AWH method is continuously improving at the correct rate, so you get better and better. Um, so how much that matters depends on your on your application case, I would say. So AWH is more robust in the sense that it always keeps improving. So if you made an initial error, you missed you missed some some parts of phase space that might have been relevant, then the, it it will keep correcting for for that. And of course, corrects correctly. I mean, if initially you sampled wrong, the final FP energy will still be correct since it reweights all the points correctly. So um, but it's quite similar, but different in the way that the weights are updated. Right. Okay. I understand that Monte Carlo Wang Dao Land Dao implementation does the same thing. It, I mean, it iterates and so on. So, okay. So that that's yes, that's yes. It does, it does conceptually the same thing, but but the way the, the way the weights are updated are are, are somewhat different. So um, uh, depends on what Wang Land you're talking. I mean, you you can you can probably make a version of Wang Land Dao that's almost nearly identical to AWH, but most versions are not exactly like that. So AWH usually converges better than than. Wang Landau methods, depending on how you set up the details. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Then the next question is going to be related to Lambda Dynamics. So Ying Chi, I'm going to unmute you and um, please feel free to try and ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice talk. So there is a method called Lambda Dynamics. It also allows the Lambda to vary during the uh, simulation. So what is the major difference between the AWH and Lambda Dynamics? Thank you. Yeah, so Lambda Dynamics, it depends on what you mean with that. So that's a very general term where it, where it just tells you that Lambda is dynamic, which it also is here. So, um, but that depends on what context it's, it's used in. So Lambda Dynamics, as I've encountered often, which I'm actually a product, project which I'm involved in, is having many Lambdas for many groups, like if you want to do constant pH simulations. So you have many protons that can, uh, appear and disappear um, and uh, dynamically and move around. So in, that's different because there are very many lambda values that are moving around. And then there's a, a difference in detail because they often use a mass to be updated depending if you use Monte Carlo for that or molecular dynamics. In our constant pH application, we use masses for them. But here you only have one lambda that moves around. Um, and that's coupled to the Hamiltonian, as we've shown here. But conceptually, lambda dynamics is not much different, except that you have many lambdas, and they often use a mass instead of Monte Carlo. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if I just may add, one difference is also that lambda dynamics as such does not tell you anything about the bias that is used, but just that you sample and can move between the lambdas. Mm. Yes, okay. it, it also, right. It, it, it also, lambda dynamics, you would not get a free energy out per se. I mean, you can, of course, compute these distributions, but you don't you don't have the potential changing. Whereas in AWH or Wang Lambda or whatever for that matter, you have a bias that gets updated. So you um, you change the sampling. That's not what happens in lambda dynamics usually. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is regarding the applicability of this approach. Uh, from uh, Thomas Stockner. So Thomas's question is, has this approach been tested for more complex systems such as protein conformational changes? The alchemical uh, reaction coordinate with AWH has not been tested for uh, protein conformational changes. But the AWH method itself has been used for that. Cor or correct me if I'm wrong, wrong back. Yeah, I must say the question is a bit confusing. So, so the the, the alchemical changes are not well. There might be a change, a conformational change involved, but it's computer free energy differences between different alchemical states, or that are chemically different, or in composition. Um, whereas conformational changes are are usually you would associate that with the same system, but in different conformational states. So that would be an application of AWH in that case, not of this alchemical case. AWH has been extensively used, used for that. That's what the method was originally uh, implemented for in Gromax and adapted. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, I will let you know if we get a response. So then we move on to, oh, thanks from Thomas. Um, then we move on to the next question, um, which is from uh, Sirab about computational time for bar runs. So yeah, his question is, what is the computational time needed as compared to bar runs? So uh, I would say that if you 
let's see if I can switch slides here. So if you mean that the computational time for to reach convergence, for example, then we can see that we, as I mentioned, we reach convergence at least as quickly. Well, here I compare, compare with M bar, but in these cases, there is not a large difference to bar either. Uh, the actual simulation efficiency is not any different uh, compared to M bar since you still have to calculate the free energy difference to all lambda points and the AWH uh, algorithm itself is very quick. So I hope that explains it but if he is interested in the actual bar analysis time that you have to do after the simulations which can take some time then that is avoided with AWH that runs the analyses as you run the simulation and then you can just get the output when you are finished. Okay, um, I will assume that answers the question. Then uh, we have time for, May for one, possibly two more questions. Um, so I'll just pick there's one more question uh, regarding uh, solvation free energy calculations. Um, so, William, I will um, let you uh, ask your question. So thank you again for a very interesting talk. And this is, uh, my question's a, maybe a bit off topic, but not really. Uh, we use Gromax quite regularly for solvation free energy calculations, but in fact, we use them for calculating standard state chemical potentials. So this uh, raises the question, do you insert a molecule? That is, do you couple the solute molecule or should you decouple it? That's one aspect. And the other aspect is, do you run your simulations in NPT or do you run them in NVT? Can you comment on each of those? Uh, so I will start with the last. And in all these cases, I have run the simulations in NPT ensembles. Okay, so can I respond? Pressure. And why do you do yeah. that? Why, why do you do that? Because N we, NVT doesn't have, a, uh, well, our philosophy or our, our view on it is NVT if you do an NPT on the solute, solvent, I'm sorry, um, and we're looking at solvation free energies, we find the correct uh, box size for that pressure. And then we can do the more complicated chemical potential calculations without a barostat, thus reducing the noise in the, in the system. And in fact, we find when we run NPT and NVT for free energy calculations, they're basically the same anyway. I haven't really thought about that, but I guess you would then get the Helmholtz free energy rather than the Gibbs free energy of solvation, if that makes a difference. Yes, that is true. I think that's what your NPT simulation gives you as well. But uh, yeah, you have to construct your chemical potential properly from a Helmholtz model. But so in a, in a, in a sense then, I mean, that this issue, NPT versus NPT is a, is a very common one when people are trying to calculate chemical potentials, um, which is not mentioned in the Gromax manual, but we think we know how to do it. What about the, and this is related to the insertion versus deletion of the solute molecule. Do you have any thoughts on that? So in general, if I were was running um, equilibrium simulations, I would start the sort of process from a decoupled state and chain the lambda setups so that I start coupling the uh, solute from there but then run the simulations along the sort of in the lambda windows. Uh, with oh. AWH I wouldn't say that it really matters. If you start from an equilibrated system with the dissolute then you should then you can use that or if you start from an equilibrated system without the solute and the solute fully decoupled, you can let AWH turn on the uh, coupling and it will also then go back and forth during the simulation. Yeah, I, can okay. also add, I, I can also add here that, I mean, if you do if you do equilibrium methods, there is no direction in principle because it's equilibrium at each lambda value, but of course you have to come up with an initial confirmation for each state, which you might generate with directionality, but there is no direction there. Here in AWH, there's, there, there, the only direction that's there is where you start from. 
but if you use multiple replicas, you could you could start all of them at one at decoupled or all of them coupled, or you could start them at a mix of whatever you want. Huh? So in that sense, there's also you can choose if there's any directionality or not. In the end, it all shouldn't matter. But. Well, if you're calculating a chemical potential, it does matter because you have to add on the ideal gas piece. If you have a rigid molecule, it doesn't matter. But if you have a flexible no, molecule, it would, only, it, would only, it would only matter if you if you simulated MVT. So your volume would matter. Anything else doesn't matter. There, there's no there's no directionality in any of these calculations. Yeah, but but wait a minute. I'm not talking about directionality. I'm talking about uh, well, in a sense, directionality, but I'm talking about calculating the contribution of the intramolecular part of the ideal gas molecule. If you, but that, uh, but that has nothing to do with with how you do these calculations. That's a choice that you make in the, in the, in the, in how you set up the Hamiltonians that you are interested in. Yes, but if you want to calculate the chemical potential, the the complete solvation free energy, you've got with a uh, with a coupling, you have to separately calculate the ideal gas contribution. With a decoupling, you don't. No, it depends. No, 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 no. That has nothing to do with coupling or deep. You can choose in Gromax if you want to couple the inter intermolecular part or not. So you can choose if you want to, if you want to go to directly to a decoupled ideal gas state, or if you want to decouple all interaction inside the molecule. There are options to do that. So there are there are choices there. But that has that's orthogonal to 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 uh, orthogonal question to these approaches. I mean, you can choose many things there, but that's not particular to to this yes. AWH okay. approach. Well, thanks very much. I'd like to continue this. Uh, offline, I'll send you an email. Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe we can, interesting yeah. Question, but this is quite important, actually. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much. For, in the interest of time, I think we will leave it there in terms of the questions. Uh, to, I would just like to thank the speakers again. So thank you, Beric and Magnus, for an uh, interesting talk, and thank you for the interesting questions. Uh, before we uh, say goodbye, um, I'd just like to tell you about an upcoming training event, which may be of interest. Magnus, if you could advance the slides one, thank you. So BioXL is organizing a summer school that takes place in June. Um, uh, they, the uh, link I will put in the chat, so you should have that now. Um, uh, this is, will cover Gromax and also other uh, core applications supported by the BioXL Center of Excellence, including uh, Haddock and, and CP2K, um, PMX, and also BioXL Building Blocks for workflow management. So you're very welcome to, to apply there and, and tell anybody who you think might be interested in this uh, event. It's a very, very well, uh, very positive. We get very lots of positive feedback about this uh, summer school. So people find it very valuable. Um, with that, uh, the final bit is if to continue this conversation or to address any of the questions that we don't have time to answer, uh, you can visit the Gromax uh, forum at gromax.bioxcel.eu. I've also put the link uh, in the chat. So thank you everyone for coming and have a good rest of your day.